Hello everyone, my name's Simon Mears and I'm the Managing Director of Airmet Scientific. I'm really pleased to welcome you all today to our webinar on this important topic, understanding the importance of indoor air quality in school and COVID related considerations. Now many of you would have very little knowledge of our organisation, Airmet Scientific, so before I introduce our guest presenter today, I'd just like to provide a little bit of background on Airmet Scientific. AirMed is proudly Australian owned and operated and we've been supporting Australian industry and businesses with occupational health and safety and environmental monitoring equipment for over 37 years. We have six offices nationally and we service a range of industries including mining, remediation, environmental defence and education just to name a few. Now as you know Indoor air quality and ventilation is an extremely current topic with all of our states taking a variety of approaches to provide a safer and healthier environment for students to return to on-site learning. So it's with great pleasure that I now will introduce our guest presenter today, Brian Murphy. Brian is a certified occupational hygienist and is also a full member of the Australian Institute of Occupational Hygiene. With over 16 years of industry experience and expertise, Brian's technical area of interest include indoor air quality assessments, ventilation system commissioning and decommissioning, hazardous facility decontamination assessment, noise and odour investigation and more. So that's it from me. I'll now hand over to Brian to begin his presentation. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Simon. So today I'm going to uh, give you an insight basically into indoor air quality considerations as part of a COVID-19 management strategy. Um, as we're all aware over the last couple of weeks and even months now at this point, there's been a lot in the media about the importance that ventilation can play when developing and designing a COVID-19 management strategy, particularly for the uh, for the built environment. So. Just going to run through today, I guess, um, a little bit about COVID-19, the transmission routes is in, how we can infect each other in the built environment, understanding that, what controls we can put in place around ventilation, and then from there, look at if we're going to improve ventilation, well, how can we continuously monitor that, as in what's a good monitoring method to ensure that it's working correctly. So returning to the world, the outside world, as per the World Health Organization, um, they've recommended that decisions regarding the reopening of offices, schools, public buildings to get people back into them needs to be guided by a risk-based approach. Uh, the purpose of this is to really understand uh, the roots of transmission of COVID-19 and ultimately look at what controls you can put in place to, to manage it. A layered approach is required to reduce exposure to COVID. And what we mean by a layered approach is basically an overall COVID-19 management plan. Um, as part of that management plan, the key one that we're going to look at today is the use of ventilation in buildings. And ultimately, that is one component of probably half a dozen, if not more, other components of a management plan that you would have in place. Um, the key thing we're talking about here today is ventilation, as in up till now, we've utilized social distancing, the use of masks, all as very effective means of limiting transmission between people. However, now that we're reopening again and getting people back into buildings, in particular back to schools, um, we're also looking at what role ventilation can ultimately play. So a key component of understanding the role that ventilation can play is understanding the airborne transmission route of the virus. Um, Initially, it was um, we were all slow to accept the fact that the virus um, could be transmitted by airborne transmission. But in um, recent months and even, even up to the last year or so, it's been well documented and well proven that basically airborne transmission is a key route of exposure. By that, we mean basically the virus traveling from one person to another um, through a droplet or an aerosol. We'll look at a slide in a moment to understand what exactly that what that looks like. To date, we've had social distancing as a, uh, as a key control measure, basically maintaining a distance of 1.5 to 2 metres from 
from a person. Um, that works well, a really, really good control. But with the smaller particles that we're going to discuss over the next couple of slides, even social distancing um, at that sort of distance is not enough to basically stop um, airborne transmission occurring. Good ventilation can reduce this. And the process and the theory is that basically if you have an infected party in a room, for example, and if there's good ventilation, well, then there's good dilution of that air in that room. So the theory is that by routinely doing air changes in that room that you're diluting the uh, the air in that room and ultimately reducing the possibility, I guess, of uh, transmission from one party to another. One thing to really re realize here is that good ventilation is not going to cure basically everything, as in it's only one component in, in, in your overall management plan. Therefore, Good ventilation is not going to remove the need to uh, limit numbers in rooms or it's not going to remove the need to potentially remove face coverings. Um, so it's a really good control, but not to be not to be assumed the only control that can work. The actual particle sizes, uh, this is really interesting. This just puts a visual, it's a, a visual representation, I guess, of how small the actual virus is. Um, you can see here basically our largest um, largest particle size on the right hand side here being a human hair. Um, that's got a diameter of approximately 50 to 180 um, uh, microns in size. That's a human hair. You can see right down on the left hand side basically the coronavirus um, particle size itself is as small as 0 0.1 to approximately 0 0.5 micrograms in size. So it is really, really small is the point I'm trying to make here. The virus itself rarely exists, I guess, in the air as the virus itself. It's normally attached to something, attached to um, a particle like a piece of dust for argument's sake, or uh, more commonly like a droplet, as in basically um, some mucus or um, saliva that may basically come out of our mouth, out of our mouth and stuff. Therefore, the virus itself is probably probably attached to something a little bit bigger, um, probably in the in the respiratory droplet size, which we've got in here as between five and ten microns in size. Um, regardless of it being attached to something else or not, it's still an extremely small particle, and to control that from a ventilation perspective um, raises lots and lots of challenges. So. I just want to give everybody a feel for the, uh, the the size constraints we're working with here. On this slide here, we give a little bit of a uh, visual representation of larger versus smaller droplets. So you can see our larger droplets there is in uh, particles and droplets probably 10 microns and bigger, as in the stuff that in 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 the daylight that you can actually see being expelled from someone's mouth if they were to sneeze or to cough or or to shout without having their mouth covered there are your larger droplets that basically they are airborne but they only remain airborne for a short period of time and they generally dissipate out of the air and fall to the ground as you can see there at a distance of probably between one and two meters the ones of real concern, I guess, are the smaller droplets. The ones that we've already said on the previous slide are the ones associated with uh, with the transmission of the virus. And these smaller droplets, basically, they can they can travel vast differences. These are the uh, distances. These are the ones we can't visually see. Um, they're basically traveling around the room. And there's lots and lots of studies done on on how long a small particle, as in down in 2.5 microns in size remain airborne for. And uh, some studies suggest that some of the smaller particles um, can remain airborne for like up to days in the right environment, as in it's not unheard of for greater than 40, 48 hours for a smaller particle to remain airborne for. So really, really important to kind of understand this concept that the size of the virus means that it basically can remain airborne for quite a while and that the transmission can basically occur over, over vast differences, uh, two, two meters and beyond. So with that in mind, we basically, we consider, well, what effect would ventilation have in our buildings on either transmitting the virus around a building, or in this instance, we're going to look at basically how we can use ventilation as a control um, against basically 
transmission between people and, and different areas. Um, I've got a selection here basically of different type of ventilation systems that we typically see in the built environment and schools in particular. Um, everything from windows that basically open um, either internally or to the, uh, to the external of a building, uh, doorways as well. The one in the center here is very commonly used. Um, this is a wall mounted split system. Um, doesn't add in any external fresh air. Uh, it's basically working on the principle of recirculated air, uh, moving air around and conditioning that air, making it hotter or colder. The one on the right here is a ducted um, HVAC system, heating, ventilation, air conditioning system. Uh, present in some schools, particularly the, the larger schools or your uh, inner city CBD schools may have these. Lots of the smaller schools will not have a fully uh, fully ducted mechanical system like that. So um, worth bearing that in mind. And then we've got these two other devices at the bottom. The one on the left hand side is just to demonstrate what a portable uh, air conditioning or uh, filter uh, might look like. And the one on the right here is an actual filter. Um, we will talk about filters in the next couple of slides and the the significant role that they can play. So basically all built environments can be broken down logically into, into having um, one or more of these, or in some instance, um, absolutely none. And an exa example of, of none would be um, an enclosed room within a building um, that might only have a door to access it, but no, but no windows. Um, one other point I'll make on this, and it's a real kind of key, key consideration and a key concept for this entire presentation and, uh, and using ventilation as a control in general is it doesn't need to be complicated as in the picture on the right on the left hand side there of the window that can be opened um, that is an extremely effective measure um, for ventilating a room and all the guidelines out there at the moment from around the world including here locally is to utilize what you already have as in it may not be a perfect solution or a perfect system but if you understand how it works and how it operates, it can absolutely be of value. And uh, the simple the simple thing of opening a window can have a dramatic effect. And uh, I'll show you shortly the risk assessments that can be done that takes all of that into account. So just a little bit about the ventilation, as in the clean natural ventilation opening of windows, um, as I said already, is simple and cost effective. The issue we face with that is um, it's fine certain times of the year um, to open the windows, but not a solution for all year round. And uh, we are looking, I guess, um, we're looking at this over over an extended period of time, as in this isn't going to be something that, that we're not going to have to deal with um, as we move into the hotter summer months and equally into the colder winter months. Therefore, using a window in a room is fine in spring and autumn potentially, but it, raises a lot of headaches and a lot of challenges for thermal comfort in particular um, if we're doing that during the winter months. Therefore, a simple solution like that may not be effective um, in isolation. The other issue we experience with opening of windows, obviously, is, is, is potentially bringing in outdoor pollutants as well. Therefore, if we've got schools in, uh, in inner cities, we could be bringing in um, other more, more hazardous and more challenging pollut pollutants into the environment as well. Therefore, we always need to consider that. Um, if we do have the benefit of a heating, ventilation, air conditioning system, a HVAC system, then basically it needs to be inspected, maintained, and cleaned. Um, a lot of these systems are installed and uh, there's little to no maintenance performed on them. And uh, uh, while they're supplying air to, uh, to an environment, um, the quality of that air may be jeopardized. There is an Australian standard for air handling uh, and water systems of buildings, and it's uh, referred to as the AS3666. That's got uh, monthly, quarterly, and annual requirements in there for the maintenance of your system. So ensure whoever manages your heating, ventilation, air conditioning systems that basically they are being maintained and managed as per the Australian standard. There's a lot of talk at the moment. You'll hear the, uh, the term HEPA filters being used. Um, a HEPA filter is a, a high efficiency particulate arrester. It's basically a very high quality filter. Um, they're used extensively in manufacturing and in hospital and healthcare type settings. Um, however, in regular buildings, schools, offices, HEPA filters on air conditioning systems um, 
it's not the norm. Uh, they come with uh, with a lot of challenges. Is in the filters themselves are obviously a very high efficiency filter. Therefore, getting air movement through them, um, not all systems are capable of doing that. So, the the idea that you just go and install HEPA filters on all of your on all of your um, air conditioning systems might sound simple and straightforward, but the reality is it uh, presents a lot of challenges. So just bear that in mind. Overall, um, whether your system needs to run all the time, uh, whether you run it at nighttime, whether you decide you're going to start it in advance of classes opening up, or whether you decide that you're going to run it after people have been in the room, um, it's all unique to your building basically and the factors that affect that overall are airflows, the volume of the space that you're in and also the occupancy levels and occupancy levels are really really important. We'll talk about those in um, the next couple of slides where we introduce uh, the concept of carbon dioxide and, and monitoring of carbon dioxide as a measurement for overall ventilation. Portable air conditioners, look, they are options. Um, lots and lots of schools are, are, are going out and they're actually purchasing standalone units that will uh, treat or condition the air in some way, shape or form. Most of the technologies involved with them, um, they relate back to basically the use of a HEPA filter, whereby basically air is pushed through the filter. The theory is that the smaller particles that we've discussed a few minutes ago, that those smaller particles are captured and that clean, fresh air is coming out the other side. There's also add-ons to them like UV sterilization and a host of other, other um, uh, arresters that can be used. Um, the issue with introducing other methods of deactivating or essentially killing the virus is they also can introduce secondary byproducts and other hazards. Therefore, the general consensus at the moment in the, in the regular built environment, like a school environment, is that um, good natural ventilation combined with some particulate filters like a HEPA filter is, 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 is more than adequate and anything above and beyond that, while may have some benefit, also comes with secondary issues and, uh, and some pretty significant secondary costs. Um, recirculating air is a big one. Uh, basically, the recirculating of air occurs when we don't have a method really of introducing fresh air into the building. A great example of recirculating air is the wall-mounted split system that we saw a couple of moments ago. They don't bring in any fresh air into the building. Um, they're basically working on the principle of passing recirculated air um, over a coil of some sort of kind, and that basically heats up or cools down. So wall-mounted split systems, um, while good for thermal comfort perspective at heating and cooling, they're not offering um, huge value whatsoever in the control of, uh, of, um, of basically the virus. Um, so the final point there, recirculating air conditioners alone will not prevent the airborne spread of coronavirus particles. So we need to be really, really, really clear on that and I guess the limitations with those systems. Here's just a diagram of a typical HVAC system that may exist. Look, the top one here um, on the bottom right hand side, it's got the outside air. So essentially what happens on these systems is um, there's an air inlet and air comes in. At some point early on in that system, there is a filter. We'll talk a little bit about the filter in a moment. The filters that are generally installed in them at that point, um, I like to refer to them as, as bird catchers, essentially, as in they are a mesh. They usually are a filter of some sort of kind, like a bag filter. Um, their purpose is, is, is not to capture any really small particles that's, that's potentially coming in. The purpose is to capture the much larger dust particles, um, um, birds, uh, insects, um, whatever it may be, um, but not to be mistaken as something that's capable generally of, of filtering out a virus. This incoming air comes in at this point, it's conditioned, heated, cooled, uh, moisture removed, and then ultimately it's moved around the building. The pink, the pink, uh, the pink diagram basically shows the return air. So these systems really work on the principle of you supply air to an area and you return that air. The reality is um, these systems do not dump all the return air back out onto the street. They actually have a fairly large recirculated air component. Therefore, it is possible um, that if you've got one of these systems that's supplying multiple areas, it is possible that it could actually be contributing to an issue as opposed to, as opposed to solving an issue. 
Therefore, it's really, really important to, I guess, understand uh, what system you have, how it's working, and how, I guess, that you can make it work uh, good for your needs. The diagram at the bottom is an example of, of, of what can occur. Um, you can basically add on extra filters onto those systems, and on the return air in particular, where you're going to be recirculating a component of that air, you can actually add another uh, filter to that, one that's capable of um, getting down to filtering particles of very small microns in size. And what you're doing there basically is any return air that's coming back into that system, it's been filtered before it gets uh, recirculated back into the system. You might say to me, oh, why can't we run a system on 100% fresh air? Well, you can, and uh, some people do, but there's, um, there's a huge cost associated with that. Um, the reason that being is... Um, Fresh air basically needs to be needs to be conditioned, it needs to be heated or cooled, and therefore you will find that in order for in order for systems to run efficiently, um, there's always a component of recirculated recirculated air that goes into them. So just bear that in mind, uh, what sort of system you have and uh, how that can work with you or against you. Here's just a bit of an overview of um, of the filtration, and I guess not to have a false sense of security about, well, we've got this ducted HVAC system and we know that it's got filters on it. Um, you need to go an extra layer and ask ask the question to your HVAC contractors, well, what sort of filters are present on that? Because the reality is, as I said already, unless it's a healthcare setting, it is um, highly possible that basically the type of filter that's present on it is actually not necessarily effective against capturing um, the particles that we're concerned about here. Um, there's a MERV rating that's given to filters. That's basically a rating system that allows you to go, well, my system has got an M6 filter on it. Therefore, basically an M6 filter is capable of only capturing approximately 40% or greater of particles in the particle range size of 0 0.3 to 1 micron in size. Therefore, without getting too technical on this, just basically ask the question of, yes, we appreciate we got filters on our system, but what sort of filters are they and are they capable of doing what they want them to do? Um, that's basically what I want you to take away from this slide. Um, that's generally a specialist activity. You can get assistance from your HVAC contractor on that, or equally you can speak with or engage an occupational hygienist that will uh, help you understand that as well. Um, on the next slide, we're gonna take a little look at basically well, how do we go about doing a review of our ventilation system? And look, I've been engaged in several instances here, basically, whereby schools in particular will come to me. Some of them will go, we're going to go out and we're going to buy X, Y, and Z, and we're not going to really do any assessments. And the reality is that approach is, it's, it's not the right approach. The right approach to this needs to be a risk-based approach, meaning you're applying some parameters to your areas that allows you to basically assess each area consistently for what it's got. And that will then allow you to basically prioritize those areas as a high, medium, or low risk environment, which then allows you to go, well, we need to do extra work in these areas, and these are the areas we're gonna focus on. So it's a, a risk-based approach, uh, far better than a kind of scattergun approach, whereby basically people just go out and buy lots of filters, lots of air monitoring equipment and, and implement it. Um, if you are gonna do a ventilation risk assessment, there's many options available to do it. One of the tools that I personally really, really like, it's uh, one that was developed by the British Occupational Hygiene Society in the UK. It's a really, really basic one, but it works very effectively. Uh, number one, it looks at the volume of the room. So your volume of room is basically your floor area uh, by the height of the room. Um, that gives you your volume. It looks at the number of area users in that room. That's really, really important because obviously if we've got one person in an office versus 30 people in a classroom, we need to look and treat them differently. This calculator also looks at social distancing. So it looks at basically are people likely to be within two meters of each other constantly or not. Um, in an office, for example, it may be infrequent. In a classroom with uh, 20, 30 uh, students in it, all of a sudden, uh, social distancing is, is much more difficult to achieve. Therefore, that's a very important consideration. And then it looks at natural ventilation. Uh, natural ventilation being really, really important, as I said from the from the outset. Uh, what type of windows or doors exist? And they do a further breakdown in that. They actually look at 
um, how far they can be opened, um, are there any coverings on those windows or doors, and uh, it assigns it basically a score. It also looks at other vents that may be present, wall vents or trickle vents, which are probably a little bit more applicable to the Northern Hemisphere than, uh, than here in Australia. And then finally, it looks at the mechanical ventilation in that room. So everything from no mechanical ventilation all the way through to you've got a HVAC system, HEPA filters on it, and basically it's um, it's on recirculation or not on recirculation. So uh, very simple considerations. The online calculator allows you to punch this data into it, and ultimately, basically, it will come back and it will give you a risk rating, and it will tell you that basically your overall ventilation in that particular area has either no effect, it's got some effect, or it's got a strong effect. And what we've been seeing from doing um, from doing lots of these risk assessments is that basically, um, where you've got a room with area users um, that are basically socially distanced to between three and four meters um, squared per person, which is the recommended guideline values at the moment, and where you've got natural ventilation, where you're able to open doors and windows, then basically the risk rating is actually coming out um, somewhere between some effect and a strong effect. Therefore, that's that's telling us straight away that basically um, natural ventilation has got a got a huge effect on this. So um, this might sound a little bit complicated, but it's it's genuinely not, and uh, it's something as I said that we're that we're doing across the board for for schools and for other buildings and. Uh, the benefit of doing this is it allows you to, as I said, allows you to concentrate your efforts on the areas that really, really need it. And it's very visual and it allows you to basically demonstrate that you've done your risk assessment and that you're actually taking a risk-based approach to this. So huge value in it and uh, well worth considering doing. All right, so just changing pace a little bit here, we're gonna basically move away a little bit from the concept of good ventilation um, the opposite to good ventilation is basically uh, poor ventilation, and the knock-on effect of poor ventilation is this kind of concept of uh, stale air. Stale air basically is, is, I guess, a term that's given to to areas and rooms where people basically uh, describe the air quality as being um, uh, maybe might be might be warm, might be stuffy is probably one of the best um, one of the best descriptions we get. Basically, stale air is something we want to avoid. If we've got stale air in a room, it is usually the first indication that the ventilation is not good. And in fact, in order for a room to reach a point whereby it feels really, really stuffy and people are complaining about it, it generally means that it's actually um, it's actually pretty bad at that point, as in the the uh, the air quality in there is is very bad. We can't see stale air. We can't see the coronavirus particles and we can't really see ventilation. Therefore, we ask ourselves, well, what is an effective parameter that we can apply and look at that will tell us, well, how good is the overall ventilation in a room? And one of the real simple, easy to use, cost-effective solutions for that is actually looking at the carbon dioxide concentrations in that room. And um, we'll speak in a moment about why that is a useful measure but at the moment you will see there is lots and lots in the media and um, all the documentation regarding this around the use of number one, good ventilation, and number two, the installation and use of uh, carbon dioxide monitors. So the next couple of slides will just explain, I guess, uh, what that means. So what is carbon dioxide? Carbon dioxide is colorless, as I said already. Um, we can't see it. It's odorless, as in you can't see it. And look, it says here it's faintly acidic tasting. Um, Faintly acidic tasting at extremely high concentrations is in concentrations that we would probably only see in um, in a manufacturing uh, industry type application. Is in you won't taste faintly acidic um, carbon dioxide levels uh, in a room. Look, it is naturally occurring. As in we have got carbon dioxide present in the regular outdoor air. Um, it's present at fairly low concentrations, generally at 350 to 400 parts per million. Uh, depends where you are in the world, and even here in Australia. If you're in a uh, if you're in a, a rural setting, it's uh, probably as low as as I've as I've shown here. In a in a city where there's a lot of a lot of traffic, a lot of industry, it's uh, generally a little bit higher. It might be up to five or six hundred parts per million, but in general, pretty low. Why do we look at it from a stale air perspective? Well, basically. Every time we take a breath inwards and we exhale, we basically, we breathe in the air to, um, 
to extract the oxygen from it. So we oxygen, oxygenate our blood, uh, basically a process that occurs in the lungs. And likewise, basically our body exhales used carbon dioxide as a, as a byproduct of, of, of basically um, of our bodies. Therefore, in a room, if we're starting to see high levels of carbon dioxide building up, then that generally means that there's um, a lot of people in that room that are breathing out carbon dioxide and poor ventilation, as in ventilation isn't adequate to dilute that. Just to put it into perspective, as in um, approximately four to five percent of the gas that we exhale when we breathe is made up of carbon dioxide, and uh, that can be up to 40,000 parts per million. So outdoor air, 350 to 400 parts per million, whereas the air that we're expelling up to 40,000. Therefore, if you've got 10, 15, 20 people in a room with doors closed, all of a sudden the carbon dioxide levels start to build quite quickly. And uh, that is exactly what relates back to this term of um, basically stale air or people feeling sluggish. People start to feel a little bit tired, a little bit, a little bit sluggish, the concentration lapses. And even way before we were looking at this stuff from a, from a COVID perspective, um, CO2 in buildings, offices, schools, um, it's been monitored for years basically as a good marker for, for air quality. And uh, I guess now it's uh, really come to the forefront as, as a method of, of, of looking at that. So carbon dioxide monitoring, um, there's a lot in the media about this at the moment. Very quickly here on the right hand side, there was um, a, a newspaper article in the New York Times at the weekend, 10th of October, basically talking about the use of indoor air qualities, uh, air, indoor air quality monitors and carbon dioxide monitors in particular. Uh, parents in the US are actually buying units um, which are now down to a couple of hundred dollars, uh, relatively cheap units that will data log and they're actually attaching them to their children's school bags, um, which uh, obviously follows the child around school for the day, but it allows the parents to basically view in real time um, on their app, well, what sort of environment is their child learning in or break or having their break in and what's the overall carbon dioxide levels. So there's there's huge public awareness, I guess, about this at the moment. Uh, probably the probably the probably the most we've we've, we've ever had um, from an indoor air quality perspective. It's got lots of lots of pros and cons. As in the pros are, we're actually looking at it very seriously, and that there's some really good changes being made. Cons being um, some of these units have limitations, obviously, and uh, without understanding how they work, uh, where they're monitoring, and the context of of where that child is, uh, some of the data can be misleading. But um, there's going to be a link sent out afterwards with some materials and a link to this particular study, not study, but this particular article that just talks about it a little bit. But one of the key messages from that is uh, a parent was able to see over the course of uh, a week or so that in the classrooms, um, the ventilation was actually uh, pretty good for where their child was, was learning. But there was a spike every day at approximately 12.30 to 1.30 and that related back to basically uh, a break time and how and where they were having their breaks and stuff. So. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's technology, I guess, that exists out there. Um, Airmed are going to talk about it um, in a lot more detail in a couple of minutes uh, when I hand over. Uh, but just bear in mind that um, yeah, these these units are now readily available to uh, not only you but also to uh, yeah to parents of children. Um, jump back here, just looking at carbon dioxide monitoring. Um, a key thing to consider is air cleaning devices. Um, so like a HEPA filter or a UV device that may be installed, uh, they will have no effect whatsoever on reducing the CO2 levels. Therefore, you may go to, uh, you may go to great lengths to uh, have controls in place to capture the virus and then you monitor your CO2 levels and you will find that, well, your controls in place to capture potential virus is very, very good, but your natural ventilation and your CO2 levels are really, really high. Um, therefore, really, really important, I guess, to get some sound advice on that, on uh, on a suitable measurement regime, um, the right type of monitors to get, um, where to install those monitors, and occupancy in rooms. All of these need to be considered before you uh, rush out and uh, install, buy and install these type of units. So what are they monitoring? As I said, 
carbon dioxide monitor is monitoring literally carbon dioxide. It is not measuring COVID. Therefore, there is no correlation that can be made between, oh, my CO2 levels are at 450. Therefore, I have no, no coronavirus con um, concerns in this area. That's not the case at all. Um, all your CO2 monitor is monitoring is the air quality overall. What it's telling you basically is that if the CO2 levels are low, then your ventilation is good and the chances and the likelihood of, of COVID spread is greatly reduced. Not eliminated, uh, greatly reduced. I guess we don't want to give anyone a false sense of security that by having low levels of CO2 that there's, that there's, no, there's no possibility of transmission of the virus. There, there absolutely is still possibility of transmission of the virus, but I guess it's uh, it's greatly greatly reduced. Therefore, I guess just fully understand that your carbon dioxide monitors um, are literally monitoring that, not the not the actual virus itself. Just on the right hand side, here's um, a couple of diagrams of pictures of what current devices look like. Um, they're gotten to the point now where they're basically very, very small probably similar if not smaller than like a mobile phone type size. And uh, basically they can be attached and wall mounted uh, to walls or any location of choice. And uh, they basically will data log. Um, Shane's gonna talk about that in a little bit more detail in a couple of minutes, but that's basically an example of, uh, of, of, of a type that's currently available. So what concentrations are we aiming to achieve? Um, we've spoken there a lot about basically monitoring it. Um, next question is, well, if we're monitoring it and what is basically an acceptable or a good value um, for good ventilation? Um, it depends, um, it's area, area specific, I guess, but in general, um, if you can achieve as low as between 800 and 1,000 parts per million, um, in the built environment, then basically you're doing a really, really good job. Um, the reality is in a lot of environments, um, it often gets a little bit higher than that. Um, but I guess a good benchmark to aim for is between this 800 and 1,000 parts per million. That's been referenced in, 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 in a lot of material, uh, particularly out of the US, the CDC um, in the US and also... Um, Harvard have have basically stated that between 800 and 1,000 parts per million is, is is a good point to aim for. We also got to remember these these levels are are very very low. These are not like health effect levels, as in no one's going to have any health effects at levels greater than 1,000 parts per million. These are indoor air quality measures, basically, as in comfort measures. Therefore, they're pretty low. And as I said, um, you need to have pretty good ventilation in place in order to achieve those sort of levels. If you find that you're monitoring it on a day-to-day -day basis and that your levels are continuously higher than that, what that indicates is that basically your overall ventilation needs to be looked at essentially. Um, what's, the, what's the controls for that? Well, there's a couple of options. Number one is you need to look at increasing your fresh air in to the building, obviously, or number two, um, reducing room occupancy. Um, if you've got inadequate ventilation coming in, then basically maybe the room isn't suitable for 20 people. It might only be suitable for half of that. Therefore, it's a bit of a balancing act to get it right. Um, but um, yeah, it's, it's, it's certainly a challenge, all right, but definitely achievable in a room with open windows. Um, you can certainly get it down to approximately 1,000 parts per million I've seen um, over lots of studies over the last while. So look, at this point, um, I'm going to hand over to um, Shane at Airmet. Shane is going to talk you through a couple of options and devices that exist for monitoring of the CO2. Um, he's going to go through, I guess, some of the pros and cons and what the monitor data looks like for the next couple of slides. And then um, he's going to hand back to myself uh, to, to close out and then we'll open up for any questions people might have at that point. Thanks, Brian, and good morning to you all. Um, as Brian has indicated, I will now run through a few offerings from MET Scientific in both standalone and telemetry solutions. Um, starting with the standalone, uh, standalone solution for CO2 monitoring utilizes the IAQ Max CO2 monitor as displayed on the screen. Its primary use is in circumstances where indicative CO2 concentrations are of interest, 
actions as a result of the readings are carried out by the persons viewing the data local to the device. For example, the teacher notices higher readings of CO2 due to change in display and opens a window or turns on an air purifier to counter this. Some features of the IOQ Max are as follows. It measures CO2 temperature and humidity, supports a rechargeable battery. The battery will support a maximum of three hours operation while disconnected from a power source. It may be powered simply via a USB, via a wall socket or laptop connection. It provides a display, a color display, including a user-friendly traffic light system indicating the current air quality, e.g. green good, red bad. Provides data logging functions at an interval ranging from one to 60 minutes. The data logger may only store a maximum of 30 days data, at which point it will begin overriding the earliest data point. It provides a simple method for recalibration, either on an automatic basis or manual. And deployment is rather simple for this product. It simply unbox the, the unit, power it on, allow it to stabilize, and it's ready to start logging. We'll now move on to our telemetry option. So Brian, thank you. MS Wireless Solution for CO2 monitoring utilizes products transmitting, transmitting data via LoRaWAN. LoRaWAN is a wide area networking protocol designed specifically to connect battery operated devices to the internet. The sensors, in this instance the ERS CO2, communicates to a gateway which data is then transmitted to AMET's cloud service. Some of the features of this product include, it measures CO2 temperature, humidity, light and motion. The battery may support up to 10 years of operation and the battery voltage, more interestingly, uh, may be also logged via our online platform. The devices send data by default to our servers every 30 minutes. This frequency can be increased, however, this will uh, reduce the life expectancy of the battery. It provides wireless deployment, no plug packs for the sensor or cables back to a central control, uh, control point, and real-time data logging capabilities via our LiveSense platform. It also provides a color display, and again, the traffic light system is utilized, indicating the current air quality. And again, green good, red bad. It supports NFC, which is near field communications via a smartphone application. This application is password protected by default, which is configured by our department. The sensors utilize an ABC algorithm or automatic baseline calibration function this is best supported in applications in which areas are not occupied all the time and have good air circulation. This function also can be disabled if the area is of specific concern. And the last feature to discuss is the downlink capability. As we're aware, applications change what was required at the time of installation might need some adjusting in the future. Via a downlink, we, we may send commands to the instruments to enable new functions, disable existing functions, or even complete a baseline calibration on routine. A good example of this is the school has returned from summer holidays and you are finding the CO2 sensors are reading, reading rather sporadic. This may be due to the fact air conditioning systems have been disabled and windows have been shut for this period. Via a downlink, we may calibrate sensors remotely without the requirement for personal interaction. This is beneficial as it is more cost effective for you and removes the requirement for contractors to attend site. Deployment of this product, um, configuration and programming is completed at the factory. Pre-checks are confirmed in the workshop to establish communication prior to dispatch. Once power is provided to both the gateway and the sensors, the system will begin transmitting data immediately. There is no user configuration required, no interaction from your IT department. Sensors install on the wall simply via a bracket within minutes. I will now share my screen to provide a brief overview of our current application with the ERS sensor in our head office. So bear with me for just one moment. Okay, as you can see on our landing page, we have a small quantity of sensors throughout our facility here at Emmet. We have a basic table displaying the, late, the last detected value and its co corresponding status. 
again, util utilizing the traffic light system, we have a clear indication of good conditions within our office. On the right, you can see some trending data from the past 24 hour period. This data may be adjusted to expand or drill further down, however required. And I'll display this here. So we can have a look at the last week's worth of data. From this adjustment, you can quite clearly see some trending data and we can further identify periods of potential concern. Although we are only seeing spikes of 600 to 700 ppm, we're at minimal capacity in the office as most would be at this stage. And this could potentially increase with the return of staff later in the year. So for our example, perhaps further investigation into these areas is required to address the potential future issues. The last section that I'll have a look at for you is alarms. So each location in this instance has their own specific alarm. Currently, these are rather basic and configured to send an email to myself in the event CO2 was to exceed 1,000 parts per million. These can be modified by the end user or controlled completely by AMET on your behalf. Alarms may also be disabled during holidays to prevent unnecessary contact. This now concludes my component of the presentation. I will now look to hand back to Brian. Thank you all for your time. Thank you for that. Last slide for the day. I just want to do a summary and a, a takeaway, a couple of points uh, before we finish up. Uh, number one is um, good ventilation is a proven mitigation strategy um, to reduce the spread of the disease in the built environment. Um, not only is it beneficial for the uh, control of coronavirus, but there's uh, significant secondary benefits as well. Basically, um, areas where we've got low levels of CO2 basically gives um, the best teaching environments and learning environments for kids, um, ultimately, um, where we've got low levels of CO2, we're generally more alert and uh, generally um, a healthy space. Second point, um, a risk-based approach is highly recommended uh, to looking at this stuff. As I said already, um, the, solution, uh, the solution is not to rush headfirst into it. Um, it's about basically assessing each of your areas um, using a, a risk-based approach that I spoke about earlier and then basically prioritizing what areas you need additional controls in, including basically the use of uh, the CO2 monitoring. Uh, simple changes to existing tools and systems um, can have a big impact. Um, nobody needs or wants the burden basically of a huge time and cost type project uh, to, to reinvent your ventilation systems. That's not what this is about. Uh, it's about basically looking at what you currently have and uh, what you can do to potentially tweak that to make it uh, a, little bit, a little bit better. And then finally, the only way to effectively assess the impact and the effect of the ventilation is, is to monitor it. As I said already, uh, we can't see, smell or taste um, CO2, for example. Therefore, we have to monitor it in some way, shape or form. And uh, uh, nowadays, thankfully, um, as discussed by Shane there, we've got simple cost-effective methods of doing that. And uh, yeah, those solutions are readily available and uh, they don't have to be a, a huge burden or a cost um, to a school to, to implement and use. So that's where basically I'm going to finish up. Thanks. <clears throat> thanks, Brian. That was, um, that was really informative. Really appreciated that. So thanks again and have a great uh, rest of the day.